us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, you know, uh, those of you who have been attending Oasis of Hope for a while, we went through the whole book of Acts together. And then uh, at the conclusion of that, it was just about Christmas season. <clears throat> so we spent some time in Advent, you know, talking about Christ's first coming. And then Rick uh, took us to his second coming. And then we went back to his first coming again. <laughs> so we went all over, but uh, it's had a great time. But during that time, I've been praying for a while, you know, uh, thinking, okay, well, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go after that in the Word? And so I've been praying, and we pray every week. On Wednesday nights, we pray for the ministry of the pulpit, and that would include what's going to be, not just who is going to speak and what, but, you know, where are we going to go? What does the Lord want us to study as a church? How does He want us to grow? And I believe that corporately God wants us to grow together. And so I believe that He is able to divinely lead us and have us go to a particular book or a series or whatever it might be. And so I felt the Lord, as I just kept praying, uh, I felt the Lord leading us to go through the book of Hebrews as a church. And so that's what we're going to do. And uh, it's kind of fun. It'll be easy to remember when we started because we're going to start on the first Sunday of the new year so we can track it, right? Will we finish by the end of the year? Uh, I'm not making any promises on, that, <laughs> on the finish date. <coughs> but um, <coughs> you know what? As long as we're in the book somewhere, um, God has something to speak to us. So we're just going to, today we'll venture just barely into the book, but we're going to start out with an introduction, yeah. a brief inter introduction to the book of Hebrews, which I've always enjoyed when uh, we're starting a new book, just to kind of get your a little anticipation of what it's about, where we're going, and then uh, dive into it from there. And, you know, many of us are familiar with the book of Hebrews, and some of, some of us maybe are not, so it's going to be a great time together. Um, so starting out, you know, the question, okay, well, what's the book basically, what's it basically about? In a nutshell, many first century Jews, um, they had left Judaism and embraced Christianity. And we saw that in the book of Acts. That's what Jesus began to speak about. The kingdom of God is at hand. You know, before him, John the Baptist had pre prepared the way. Jesus preached the message of the kingdom. And then uh, after his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, um, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, they went out and began to preach the kingdom. And as a result, there were... There were a number of Jews who had converted from Judaism to Christianity. And because of that, they had been facing a lot of persecution from their own countrymen. We saw how much Paul was persecuted. But all those, especially the Jews who had turned to, to Christianity, that they faced that persecution. And so it was a real you know, intense pressure to escape that persecution. You know what? What if we just go back? What if we just start to go back to temple worship and animal sacrifice? And it wasn't necessarily that they were just going to totally abandon their faith, but it was it was a sliding back. Right? It wasn't like, hey, we renounce Jesus, but I wonder if we can kind of do both and not have to face this persecution. So it's a turning back. And, and in a number of Paul's epistles, he warns against things like that, like in Galatians and other places, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to combat this temptation of self-preservation is really what it is. Uh, by turning back from Christ, the author, he begins to lay out one compelling argument after another Basically, he's asking the reader a question through all these 
arguments that he lays out. If you turn away from Christ now, to what will you turn? You're wanting to turn back from Christ. What are you going to turn to? He demonstrates that Christ is so vastly superior in every way to everything and everyone who's preceded him. If one turns away, <clears throat> what you're left with could only be described in the words as Paul puts it in Galatians. He says, it's turning back to the weak and beggarly elements. <laughs> right? It's like leaving the king's table and the best imaginable banquet you could ever enjoy and, you know, picking up roadkill. <laughs> I mean, it's weak, it's beggarly to go backwards once you've, as the writer says, tasted of the heavenly gift. And the reality was that there was far more to be gained in turning and converting to Christianity than could ever be lost in Judaism. Yeah. Isn't that pretty cool? Yes. They didn't go from the superior to the inferior. That's what the book is wanting us to learn. This is, if you go back, you're going to go from the superior to the info inferior. But if you go forward, um, you've attained the fulfillment in Hebrews, the author demonstrates the superiority of Christ, both in his person and in the works that he, that he did and that he's doing now. As it relates to his person, as we go through the book, he, he shows that he's superior to the prophets, to the angels, to Moses. In relation to his works, Christ has a priesthood that's superior to the one that Aaron had, being a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever, which if you're not familiar with that, we're going to get to it. Some of you know that Jesus uh, didn't come from the tribe of Levi, which is who Aaron came through, which the priesthood came through. But Jesus came from through the tribe of Judah, which there is no priesthood. So Jesus has a totally different priesthood, and that's good news for us. <clears throat> and he's also superior in that he's the mediator of a new and better covenant. There was, there was a mediator of the old covenant. We're going to talk about that. The mediator was the law. But Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. The better covenant, which includes a new sanctuary and a new final sacrifice. And then after, so the author basically takes like 10 chapters and just lays out like case after case after case of why, why Jesus, why don't go back. What's the warning? Don't go back to Judaism. He lays out all these truths. And he warns his readers, he says, there's a danger in discarding your faith. You're on dangerous ground if you're wanting to. And that's what it is. To return is really a discarding of your faith. And then in chapter 11, as an encouragement, he talks about the kind of faith that it takes to please God. And he does that through reminding them through all these lives and examples of the Old Testament saints and starts to lay out one victory or one triumph over another in God. Why? As an encouragement for us, because he says, therefore, right, chapter 12, because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, um, keep looking in faith unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. They did it. They ran well. And many of them didn't obtain the promise in this earthly realm that they were promised, yet they were looking to something better, to a city without foundations, whose maker is God, eternal in the heavens. And so he says, you guys keep going, persevere. And it's a call um, to be willing to endure hardship and suffering. And that's a great uh, next thing to go into. We look at the Book of Acts, the example of Paul, 
of Silas, of Barnabas, of Timothy, all these workers who were willing, of Stephen, so many names who were willing to endure hardship and suffering. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you need to persevere in your faith and not turn back. And he says, and you want the ultimate example? It's not just all these people that I talked about in Hebrews chapter 11, which we call the Hall of Faith. You want the ultimate example? Let me remind you and turn you right to the example of Christ, his endurance. And he writes in Hebrews 12, 3 and 4, he says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. He says, you guys are becoming weary. You're becoming discouraged. Consider Jesus. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And we know, right, the Bible teaches that Jesus was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And he was willing to endure that shame. You and I and all the readers who are reading that letter, if you were alive and you were reading that letter, you haven't resisted yet to the point of bloodshed in your struggle against sin. I haven't, you haven't. The fact that we're listening to this right now is, you know, testimony to that fact. So you want some encouragement? Look unto Jesus, what he was willing to endure, right? And when Christians, then he goes on, he says, when Christians must endure the chastening, not if Christians, but he says when, you know, Christians must endure the chastening of God for a season. Don't be discouraged by that either. Don't let God's chastening for a time discourage you. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Do you have the witness that you're a child of God because he's had, had to discipline you in love? I have. It means you're not illegitimate. It means you're a son, you're a daughter. You know, I don't have the right to be, you know, at home down, hometown buffet and smack someone's kid because they're being rude at the dinner table. <laughs> I would go to jail, <laughs> right? Why? Because that's not, you know, it's not my place. They're, they're not my child, right? And of course, I shouldn't smack them around anyways, but you know what I mean? But lovingly... I don't have the right to lovingly discipline them. But the fact that God does discipline us, it, it means that we're adopted into the family. Amen. And so don't be discouraged. Say, you know what? It's better to take the chastening of the Lord than be beat up by the world and beat up by the devil. I'd rather get my spankings from the Lord and love and learn my lesson and move on, right? And then in the, after he gets through that, in the final chapter, chapter 13... The author calls on these Christians to walk out their faith in love for one another and demonstrate it to those who rule over them in the faith. You know, and he, he talks about things like showing hospitality to strangers. By doing so, some have unwittingly, unknowingly entertained angels, right? Mm -hmm. He talks about uh, how we ought to love one another in marriage. And do what's right. And so all these exhortations. And then also within the church. How do we love those who labor amongst us? You know make their jobs easy. He basically says. He says don't make their jobs a burden. As those who oversee your souls. Uh, make it a joy for them to be a leader in God's church. And not a, not a burden. And then he closes with. One of the best benedictions that you'll find in the whole Bible. We'll save that. We'll get to that. And then with some final greetings. Um, well, and we get to this point. We go, okay, introduction. Okay, so who was one of the first things you're going to want to know? Who wrote the book, right? When, you're, when someone says, hey, let me 
you ought to read this book. What's one of the first questions? Who wrote it? Good question. <laughs> the short answer, as the theologian Origen said in the third century, <laughs> and I'm sure others said it beforehand, but he's quoted as saying, God only knows. God alone truly knows the answer. In some ways, the language, the style, the theology, they're similar to Paul's writings in some ways, in some ways they're not, with Timothy being mentioned at the end of the letter as well. So it's interesting, right? Um, but in opposition to Paul being the author, I'll give you just a few points. You, you can believe or think whatever you want. You just got to work that out yourself. Um, but a few points that would oppose it and say that probably he didn't write it. The Greek used in Hebrews is way more sophisticated and polished to that than any that, that Paul used in his other letters. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, there's an interesting reference. It's doubtful that Paul would have re referred to himself as one who learned about the salvation of the Lord from those who heard Jesus. There's a reference in there that they learn, you know, he says, how shall we escape so great a salvation if we neglect it, right? And he's talking, and he goes on to say, which we basically learned from those who heard Jesus and confirmed it to us. But Paul, we know, was an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus. He received his doctrine firsthand. He said he didn't learn it from any human um, you know, person. The Lord Jesus gave him direct revelation. And so it wouldn't really fit for him to have written. That's, that's a good case. Um, moving on, there's no customary salutation from Paul, beginning with his own name that we see in all the other letters. Thirteen letters. Every single one says Paul, an apostle or a servant or a bondservant of Jesus Christ to whoever. And it, it would be strange to have, if this was one of fourteen, um, that he broke that that pattern that we see. And uh, reading through the book of Hebrews, Paul, what one thing noticeably absent is the compound titles that Paul used in all of his other letters, like the Lord Jesus, or Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, our Lord, things like that. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus is simply referred to as Jesus, Lord Jesus. Or Christ and so there's almost no usage of the compound titles that Paul does in all of his other letters mm -hmm. and there's you know there's a lot more reasons that you could go through uh, but these just these even these right here would probably make a good case that Paul's not the author other writers so okay if Paul wasn't the writer uh, who else might it have been there's a lot of people been suggested. They suggested Barnabas, Luke, Clement of Rome, Apollos, Silas, Philip, and even Priscilla got her name in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> now we do see how sharp she is in, in the book of Acts. So. But <clears throat> while uncertainty surrounds the both the authors, authorship, the location of, of where it was written, the timing, the timing we can kind of pin down because of mentions of Timothy and some others, and also there's no mention of the destruction of the temple. And so the timing, they pretty much think somewhere between AD 64 and 68. And so that makes sense. But where? We don't know. Um, it, but the one thing that we do know is that the recipients of the original letter... Uh, did know who the author was. Mm -hmm. There was no mystery between the author mm -hmm. and those who received it. Yeah. They knew. It made perfect <laughs> sense to them. They knew who was writing to them. But for all these reasons, um, 
Well, what's interesting is you think about it. For some reason, whoever received the letter, the readership, it, it somehow it didn't get passed down. That information was lost of who wrote them the letter. Isn't that kind of interesting? Like most of the other ones, the, so there's no real internal evidence that we can go by and really no, no external evidence. Um, and because that was the case, it led to a really late recognition of Hebrews as being divinely inspired and recognized and admitted into the canon of Scripture. It was all the way in the 4th century before they, both because of the style, because of the content, the theology, and everything else that's amazing about the book, they finally decided, in the, that's in the Western Church, that's when they recognize it. In the Eastern Church, they recognized it from day one because they believe it's one of 14 instead of one of 13 of Paul's letters. So if you believed it was written by Paul, it immediately made it into the canon, as in the Eastern Church. But in the Western, it took them a while to say, no, this is... But on further analysis, they're, they're like, this is divine. So <clears throat> I like what... Um, Rick laid out for us talking about the goals because guess what I'm going to give you a few more goals <laughs> if 10 wasn't enough I'll give you 13 or 14 yeah well, well not in, in addition just like 3 or 4 more for a total of 13 or 14 oh thanks but you know <laughs> but why go through a book if we don't have some goals yeah so I thought let's have some goals before we even and I don't know if I laid out a bunch before an accident, doesn't matter, but <clears throat> I want to lay out and ask, you know, what are some of the, I want to communicate and share with you, what are some of the concepts that I want us to gain a greater understanding of as we go through Hebrews together? And so for the first, I want us to gain a deeper understanding of the heavenly work and ministry of Jesus as our high priest. And what that means for us. Have you thought about his heavenly ministry? That he's doing as our high priest right now? Yeah. I mean, we do a little bit, but sometimes we may not think about that so much. Well, you know, what does that mean for us that Jesus is currently our high priest in heaven? What does that mean for us? How does that impact us? And what's available because of that? Um... Andrew Murray says in his book on Hebrews, the holiest of all, the one object of the epistle is to set before us the heavenly priesthood of Christ and the heavenly life to which he, in his divine power, gives us access. That's something to wrap your mind around, right? The one object of this letter is to put before you and me, put it right before us, the heavenly priesthood of Christ and the heavenly life to which he in his divine power gives us access. We have access into a divine power in life that how many Christians do we know are not living, not living that out, not accessing that, living so far below like having the keys to a Ferrari and you're, and you're riding the tricycle in the driveway. God's like, what are you doing? Take the keys to the Ferrari. <laughs> Look at all that horsepower. What in the world? And we're on tricycles, you know, wondering why it's not working out so good for us. This gives the epistle its inestimable value for all time, that it teaches us the way out of the elementary stage of the Christian life to that of full and perfect access to God. And that's what I want for us. I want for us, any of us who are in that place, and I'm sure we all have room to grow, let's leave the elementary stage of Christianity, of Christian life, and let's go on to the full and perfect access to God. Complete. Let's get to that complete access. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. 
let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's gain a deeper understanding of that, right? Jesus, the Son of God, who's passed through the heavens. That's pretty awesome, huh? Secondly, another goal that I want for us is that we deepen our understanding in spiritual things. It goes along with the first point, but as the, the writer mentions in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. He's like, hey, let's go on to secondary school. Let's go on to graduate school. Let's go on, you know, let's go on and deeper. Let us go on to perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the do doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And I like that, yeah. Hopefully that's what we can do. We can move on from the elementary principles and on to the next things that God wants us to know. And it's kind of another way of saying, try this, instead of saying, God willing, say, this we will do if God permits. Just puts a new little twist on it, right? <laughs> but that's what I want to do. If God, God permitting, God take us further, right? In Hebrews, it places a heavy stress on doctrine concentrating on the nature, person, and work of Christ, as well on, as soteriology, which is uh, the study of salvation. So we've got a really deep and rich Christology, which is all about the nature, person, and work of Christ. Christology. And soteriology. We have some deep doctrines about salvation in this book. And as you guys know, there's definitely some challenging passages that we'll get to. And I always want to say, every time when we come to a challenging passage, that's our opportunity to reason through, to wrestle with, and go deeper in our understanding of the scriptures. Never be afraid. We're finite. God's infinite. Never be afraid to come to the scriptures and try to wrestle with it and say, God... I don't understand what in the world does this mean or maybe this even means something that looks apparently conflicting you know or contradictory but we know that it's not and so when we come to those things the first thing we say God you're infinite and I'm finite so that's the first problem is why I'm having a mental meltdown I can't understand this but God wants us Let's move on from the elementary principles. Let's go deeper. Let's allow God, let's challenge ourselves. Let's wrestle with scriptures. Let's look at it in light of the chapter, the book, and the whole book. And see what we can come up with. And number three, uh, a goal for, for us is for us to gain a better grasp of the Old Testament. Because as we go through Hebrews... The Old Covenant and the New Covenant, they're compared and they're contrasted in the person and work of Christ. How are they saying? How are they different? How do they, you know, relate? And my hope is that those who are not very well versed in the Old Testament, which is the first dispensation, which is the first mode of worship God gave, the first religion which was provisional, which was preparatory, you know, and it was intended to pass away. That's one of the first things we need to understand is that the Old Covenant was intended to fade away. It was preparatory. It wasn't forever. It was to, you know, prepare until, like we've been, the phrase we've been enjoying until the fullness of time had come for the deeper revelation. So my prayer is that we gain a greater understanding, you know, of 
both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant as we go through this book. Let me read uh, what someone said here. What the Old Covenant gave and wrought was not meant to satisfy, but only to awaken the expectation of something better that was new to come. If you want a major theme of the book of Hebrews is that this is the something better. This is the better covenant. This is the superior. And if you come to this and you leave it, you could only leave to go to something inferior. The new covenant was the fulfillment of what had been promised, and it was destined to last forever because it, it was itself a complete revelation of an everlasting redemption, of salvation in the power of an endless life. And that's one of the keys is when we talk about Jesus being in the order of Melchizedek, he is so because of the power of an endless life. We'll, we'll get to that. As the Bible commentator Gabeline, I, I like that name, it's German, Gabeline points out. In this epistle, we find the law, the prophets, and the Psalms more quoted than in any other portion of the New Testament. Did you catch that? In the book of Hebrews, we find that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are more quoted than in any other book in the New Testament. As a result, we're going to have a lot of good opportunities you know, to look into God's first revelation. That's what we're doing. If we're looking at the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. We're looking at the first revelation uh, that God gave of himself. And then we can see, then we find the fulfillment of that revelation in Christ. <clears throat> A key to understanding the entirety of the whole uh, Old Testament revelation is given to us in the opening statement of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. So if you guys want to open your Bible, we, we will at least get into Hebrews, you know, beyond my, uh, my introduction, which I'm sure you're thankful <laughs> to finally get into the Word now. <coughs> Let me read verses, uh, or portion of verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. And I want to stop, stop right there. You know, God who at various times spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. I like how this letter starts out. There's no... Uh, Hey, how are you? It's so and so. Oh, I praise God. I have this opportunity to write this letter to you. You notice there's no greeting, there's no salutation. It just gets straight into the message. And one reason I like that is because that's kind of the, you know, I'm a get to the point kind of person. And once business is taken care of, I feel like I can relax. And then, um, I don't mind, I'm happy to chit-chat. But until then, I'm exercising patience. Like if I'm having a conversation or initiating something, I'm trying to observe all the customary politeness and patience. And I'm thinking, man, I can't wait to just get to the point. Why are we having this conversation? Why are you writing me the letter? No worries when it comes to Hebrews. We dive right in from the first verse, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you are like that, too. Yeah, I got I got one. I, I'm not the only person here, so I don't feel so bad. But if, if you ask my wife, I've tried to grow, but for many years, I would be on my way home from work, you know, and the very first question, hey, what's for dinner? <laughs> not, hey, how, how are you? How was your day? So I'm trying to graduate from that, but I'm like, get to the point. Okay, I've got fried chicken, I've got potatoes, I've got <laughs> green beans. Okay, whew, okay. Oh, hi, how was your day? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said that. 
So enough about my problems, but I, I'm just saying I love how Hebrews starts out, right? Dive in from the first verse. But as he opens, he says something we need to we need to grab a hold of, which is very apparent, but he says that God is the one who speaks. That's where he starts. He spoke to the fathers through the prophets. And an interesting observation to make in reading through Hebrews, right? I've said that it's more quoted, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And as much as they are quoted, the writer never refers to Moses, never refers to David, never refers to Isaiah as saying, you know, oh, in Moses he says, or the prophet Isaiah said, or David says in the Psalms, but the only one, you know, who he attributes the speaking to is the one who divinely inspired these men of God by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The emphasis is on God and what he wanted to communicate. We know David wrote the words and Isaiah wrote on the scroll or whatever, right? But beyond that, we all understand that all scripture is divinely inspired. Men wrote as they were moved by God. But in this, it's just God said, boom, God said, direct quotations from all those. And it also just shows, it gives us a little bit more um, confidence in the inspiration of Scripture. It's not David said, it's God said. Because mm -hmm. God wanted David to write it. And David did. Mm -hmm. Or Isaiah or whoever. So it's interesting. You'll, you won't see, well, in the prophet Isaiah, no. God spoke at this time, boom. God spoke to the fathers in many ways over thousands of years. In describing the speaking, we could say it came in many portions or fragments. And that's one of the challenges of the Old Testament for, for all of us. Taking all of God's revelation of his speaking at various times... And in various ways, it's basically it's taking all of those pieces or fragments and synthesizing them into one coherent whole. It's like putting together many small pieces of stone and glass until, keep putting them together, putting them together until what happens? An image appears. It's like assembling a mosaic. We need to approach the Old Testament like we're putting a mosaic together. And we need to put all the pieces, the many times, the various ways, and put them all together that God spoke and, and see what it looks like. One Bible teacher speaking about this idea of a mosaic, he put it like this. One aspect of truth was seen in one type another and another, they needed to be combined if the full truth was to be known. And in diverse ways, in many ways, by types, prophecies, requirements, providences, angelic ministry, human teachers, etc. Thus the old revelation had great disadvantages. What's the disadvantage? We, it takes a lot more concentration and effort from us, right? It means we're going to have to be, but I hope that's an encouragement as you think about and study the Old Testament. That's why you got to read the whole thing to get the whole picture. If we just pick and choose, we're getting some truths, some aspects, but we're getting them in little fragments and little portions. And so the more we read through, the law, the prophets, the wisdom literature, the Psalms, the Proverbs, all that, you know, the minor prophets, the major prophets, the more that we can put it together and grasp, you know, the more we're going to be like that person building a mosaic. And when we stand back, we're going to have a lot clearer picture instead of looking at a couple little stones and going, I don't get it. So that's, that's, if you could call it a disadvantage, that's the disadvantage uh, 
of the Old Testament. And then he goes on to talk about the contrast. That was the first revelation, God speaking, and he says, In these last days, he spoken through his son, right? He hath spoken unto us by his son, no longer in fragments or by many voices, but by one living person, the embodiment of the Father's thoughts concerning us, the Word made flesh. And that's another reason why we, why we rejoice. Wouldn't you agree that the Gospels are a little easier to read and to understand what's the message? We got one person. It's just, you, you know, it helps us. God knew that. Of course that's helpful. Instead of, you know, having all these fragments, we have it all in one. Christ, not only the messenger, but the message. Why did God speak, talking about the first revelation, in various times, in different ways, by the prophets to the fathers? Why were there so many pieces used in putting together the revelation of God to man, of assembling that mosaic to us? First of all, it's because how God chose to. <laughs> That's the easy answer, right? But a simple reason was the fact of man's mortality. A prophet's ministry was limited. He was called by God. He was equipped, used in service, and then what? He eventually died. And that necessitated a replacement. If a man is going to speak for God, he's got a limited window, and then he passes away. And then so another arose, and then another, from Moses to Elijah to Elisha, all the way down to Malachi. And so the Old Testament revelation of God is like one of those connect-the-dot pictures. You guys remember those? Yeah. They did them in school. They probably been around... You know, for quite a while. Um, when you start out, you're looking at this big page, right? With all these dots and numbers. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea what the picture is. But as you continue from point to point to point, the image begins to emerge until it's finally complete. Until what the creator knew would be revealed is clearly seen. So when we come to the Old Testament... I want you to feel like a kid having a good time connecting the dots. <clears throat> Go from point to point to point that God laid out and let, let that full picture emerge until God was the one who set it all up so he knows what the picture is going to look at like before we see it. Just like the person who did the connect the dot, you know, picture. They already know what you're going to discover. But that's our discovery. Our discovery is to be led till we see it. And that's, that's the Old Testament, you know, revelation. And so a careful study of the Old Testament, it's a progressive connecting of the dots until not only we see, but we hear why do we say here? Because God has spoken, right? God has spoken. And so we study until we can hear what God wanted to communicate with man through that revelation. And it was interesting in our psalm, Psalm 29, how many times it say the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord shattered the timbers, the voice of the Lord did this and did that, right? God has spoken. Another reason, you know, God chose to speak in various ways and times through the prophets was to build the anticipation until one day the one of whom Moses prophesied would come. Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brothers. Him you shall hear. Listen to him. Why? Because he's going to speak. And that will, you know, that was, we, they realized and we know that was God speaking. Right? Of all the holy men of God who followed Moses, 
on our point to point through the Old Testament revelation of whom alone did Moses speak? Of everyone that was going to follow him, he spoke of Jesus. He said, there's a prophet, capital P, like me. Him you shall hear. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And if you skip to verse 3 in chapter 1 of Hebrews, it says, Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews starts out with the superior superiority of Christ over the prophets. Which of the prophets were ever described, let alone actually possessed the brightness, the radiance, the extreme brilliance of God's glory? How many prophets ever were described that way, let alone had that? Zero, right? Not a single one. But let me take you real quick to a passage in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. We're just going to read through it. You can turn there if you want. Mark 9, 2 through 7. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And at this point in the scene, God the Father, he steps in and he speaks, and what does he say? And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This <coughs> is my beloved Son. Hear him. The time for speaking his revelation through the prophets, through Moses, through Elijah, had passed. The fullness of time had come. The final complete revelation was standing right there in their midst. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Right? That's what the writer of Hebrews says, that Jesus was the brilliance, the radiance, the brightness of the glory of God. And Peter, James, and John, they got to have a glimpse of that in the flesh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus showed them for a moment his eternal glory, and they were greatly afraid, right? It was an awesome moment. As Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Of John the Baptist, this is what Jesus testified. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So talking about the ministry of the prophets to the fathers, right? He was the forerunner of Christ. And Jesus said of him, among those born, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist. That was his testimony. And what was the great prophet's testimony of Jesus? I'm not even worthy to un untie his sandal strap. And John was the greatest. So John is the representation of all those who preceded, who came, and God spoke through to the fathers. And the greatest of them said, I'm not even worthy to tie Jesus' shoe or untie it. He said, I must decrease, he must increase. The superiority of Jesus over the prophets you know, that's just an intro today and a little teaser of where we're going to be heading through the scriptures together. This is your invitation, yours, yours, and this is my invitation to go to the mount. In Hebrews, we get to go to the mount of transfiguration. 
And we get to see Jesus shining in his eternal glory as our great high priest who's alive and well and active in the heavens right now, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, right? This is our, our journey that we get to go and see the sun, you know, see the sun shining in all of his brilliance. And even that song we sang today, you know, um, I forget how it goes, but it says, who shines in all his brilliance. You know, the king of glory, shining in all his brilliance, right? This is our invitation, not just to see Jesus, but to hear him whom God has spoken through in these last days. Jesus is the final, complete, full, perfect revelation of God. God said, everything that I wanted to speak to you, I said in Jesus. Yeah. Everything I want, you want to know what I want to tell you? I want to tell you Jesus. Right? That's why we look to him. That's why we study him. That's why we worship. Second person of the Godhead. Eternal mystery. Right? That's why we have Christmas. Because he came and he's the final voice. The question, you know, it's not, has God spoken? It's, do we want to listen? God has spoken. Listen to Jesus. Everything he wants to say, it's in Jesus. And it's not just, it's everything. You know, like, you ever look at a sunset or a painting or something, and someone says, this speaks to me? It's everything about Jesus, right? It's not just his words, his teachings. It's every portrait, everything that we've been taught and passed down, it speaks to us. He's speaking all day, every day, but do we want to listen, you know? And the more that we can grasp it, you know, we can explain it to someone else. Hopefully we can tell them about the brightness of his glory. And so anyways, I hope that whets your appetite for the journey that I feel God is going to take us on to go through the book of Hebrews to see Jesus high and lifted up, shining in the light of his glory. That's what I want to see, right? Pour out your power and love, Lord, as we sing holy, holy, holy. You know, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, right? That's what we want to do. We want to see him high and lifted up. And so that's our, that's our privilege today. You know, as Steve comes and he's going to lead us in a song, if you've never given your heart, your life to Jesus, Jesus is God's final revelation. You know, Jesus, he said, whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast out. Right? Come to me, all you who labor and are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. Come to Jesus. Listen to what he want, God wants to say to you. And most of all, God says, I love you. I laid down my life for you. Do you want to come back into relationship with, with me? I'm waiting for you. That's your invitation. Steve?